Hey everyone, it's Carter. Welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the show where I sit down with writers of all sorts of backgrounds and we just have a great conversation and um, I get to learn about them, what things that they like to write about, how they write, how they approach things, and I'm always learning something new. And today is no exception to that. Uh, Today I spoke to Lynn Griffin. So Lynn is um, um, an educator and a therapist by trade and she has uh, become a novelist. So she has both nonfiction and works of fiction out there as well. And recently she kind of made a pivot to um, (laughs) the darker side of fiction, uh, domestic suspense. So more closely aligned to what I write. And um, her newest book, which just came out, is called The Dangers of an Ordinary Night. And it's got a beautiful cover to it. Um, So definitely check that out. But she's not a formal writer by training. So it was interesting to hear you know, her progression through that and her reliance on feedback and critique groups, um, very similar to, to, to me, you know, when you're not really sure how to write a novel, how do you go about doing it? Um, and you know, she has since gone on to actually teach about writing as well. But I, I feel like through our conversation, she would just say he, things here and there. I'm like, Oh, I've never, I never really thought about it that way. Um, and she made an interesting comment about editing and when you get this editorial letter, letter um, from your editor, the, the first one, the big one, the scary one, how it's best not to react to it by immediately starting to make changes to your manuscript, but actually letting it you know, sit within your mind for a few days and let it percolate. Because if you, if you just try to get things done immediately, you're editing from a defensive posture. And I never thought about it that way. And because that's my nature is I always love to try to get things done, check things off my list. Um, but I never thought about, you know, that puts you in a defensive posture when you're editing and that might result in maybe subpar uh, results when you're writing. So anyway, I learned a lot of stuff from her. Um, she was fantastic to talk to. I hope you enjoy. This is my conversation with Lynn Griffin. just found out what today that the new york times named it one of the best books to give this holiday season that's amazing that's so exciting good for you (laughs) thanks (laughs) so it'll be interesting to see the impact of that if you can if you can tease it out at all i know it's it's you know you hear all these different things about hitting different lists or you know getting reviews in certain uh, publications and it's so hard to tell like what what actually moves the needle um, exactly. with sales. And, you know, it's, it's such an opaque industry that <laughs> I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that. I agree. And I think the answer is variable too. You know, I think some things depending upon when they hit and how, um, but it just feels like a really nice validation after all the hard work, you know? Well, validation is such a big thing, right? Yeah. That, that's, yeah. that, I just, um, I, I have a, a blog post coming out about imposter syndrome because that's, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people and, and that's just this one common thread is that so many writers just are really don't feel validated. They feel like they're a fraud. And, you know, if they happen to do well, that's like, I got lucky. It's, 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 it's amazing. So yeah, you, you, so you have that moment where like, okay. And it's not like I'm great. It's like, okay, maybe I'm not terrible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, hey, I re- maybe it was worth persevering this time you right know? i mean that that was my sense when i when i first got the first time i got a starred review from like you know, publishers weekly i'm like that to me was somehow so meaningful yes. and that was you know, probably a decade into it all exactly. <laughs> you know you're like okay maybe maybe i kind of know what i'm doing but yeah, yeah. so so where are where are you located i'm located in situate mass Okay. Did you, are you uh, New England kind of born and raised? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Where, so in Massachusetts itself, you're. Yeah. So I grew up in central mass and, um, and then I moved after I, I went to college in Boston. I lived there for a really long time. And then when I got married, we came South. So we're about halfway between the Cape and Boston. Okay. Okay. And what were your parents doing when you were growing up? What kind of work did they do? My father was the advertising director for the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. Okay. So in in the publishing industry. 
Yeah, more on the advertising end. But yeah. A paper, and um, he cared deeply about journalism. Um, and my mom uh, started her career as a teacher and then was a stay-at-home mom. Okay. And, and your, your dad, I'm sure, saw, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you know, when he worked until, but you know, certainly the decline of, of, of the newspaper industry. And that's good. And that must have been kind of some hard times to go through just seeing that the, just the shrinking circulations and, and, you know, if he was really, you know, deeply rooted in, in that. Yes, he he definitely felt the stress of that because the advertising dollars that came into the paper were its revenue. So. Right. So yes, I definitely saw him experience the stress of that going up and down, you know? Yeah. And, and he just kept, kept, kept working in that industry. Yeah. Unfortunately he died quite young. He oh. was 47 when he had a heart oh, attack. Wow. Yeah. And That's scary. Uh, very, and it, you know, it definitely influenced our family in terms of how we all coped and the issues that it raised for all of us, which it finds its way into my fiction, of course. Oh, I'm sure. Um, it that that stuff is so informative my my father passed at a relatively early age 69 of of but of early onset alzheimer's and so that is you know then it's even kind of unconsciously you go back and you look you're like wow there's this thread of memory in all of these books that i don't even know sometimes i was intentional about it but other times you you like why do i keep writing about people forgetting things and you're totally influenced by by those kind of traumas for sure um, and it's it's kind of a way of healing right because you're working through it in fiction do you do you get a sense of that for yourself definitely and i feel like i return to it intentionally because i feel like there are so many things to learn about it but also there are so many other experiences different from mine that still tap tap into grief and the power of grief and the long shadow of grief so this new book that I wrote about is about addiction. And obviously within that phenomenon, uh, there, there's lots of grief for the people who are associated with the people who struggle. Right. Um, you know, the intimate partner and the children. Um, so it's a lot. Now, we're probably going to go back and forth a little bit here, but when you approach like your, your latest release, for example, when you sit down with the idea for it, is this something that, you just want to explore it, or is it like, okay, I think this would make a good story. And I think there's a market for this, or is it like, you know, this is therapy for me and I want to explore this story and I'm not sure what the end result's going to be, but it's important that I write this. For me, it always starts with character and a social issue because in addition to being a novelist, I'm also a family counselor. Mm -hmm. So I always know that I want to explore a particular issue. And I also know that I want to examine it through the lens of a particular kind of character. So in this case, I really wanted to look at the impact of addiction on marriage and parenting. So I knew it needed to be a mom at the center. I knew it also needed to have a therapist at the center. Um, and so I always knew at least that going in. And then the rest of it reveals itself to me as I go. And I'm just as much a writer who writes to discover as I am a writer who writes with intention. Uh, so you're, not, I, you're not you're, outlining necessarily. I do eventually, yes. Um, I may start off with exploring the character and the issue, uh, but I pretty quickly get to the point where I need to plot because I need to know where I'm trying to write to. Right, right. So when you, and when you choose a social issue, what's the intention is, you know, is, is the attention behind that, like, this is what I do, and this is what I'm knowledgeable about, and it's interesting to me? Or is it more like, you know, I think this is an important message that I can get out through my fiction, or is it a mix of everything? It's definitely a mix, but I would say that I try really hard not to have a message. Mm -hmm. I, try, I try really hard to let readers imagine what they would do in complicated circumstances. I don't have any difficulty letting the reader get a little uncomfortable with characters who make some poor choices related to those things. It's my intention for them to walk away and say, hey, who knows what I would do if I were faced with that, but at least I can imagine what that must have been like. So I think it's more for me an exercise of empathy than it is anything else. Um, yeah. I don't think there are a lot of things in life that have a right answer. <laughs> that's true that's true and, and and i you know i think empathy is the key word i think 
it, my my opinion has always been to be a good writer. I think you have to have a pretty deep well of empathy, and that doesn't mean that you know you're going to write these amazing characters every time, or or even sympathetic characters, but just even kind of being able to capture voices and you know going through their struggle. It's hard to do if if you don't yourself as the writer kind of contain that. And I've over time I've learned like you know how to develop that and how to hone that, but. Um, I, I don't know. So it seems like you're a pretty, if you're a counselor, you're a pretty empathetic person to begin with, I would think. I, I would hope so. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would hope that the people that come to me here in my, in my listening and in my attempts to provide advice, that I don't think there's any one right way to do anything, that there's a lot of right ways. Um, and I think what's very cool about being a counselor and being a novelist is that um, social science tells us that the novel is a real vehicle for exploring social issues and for really trying to put ourselves in the shoes of other people. Um, I think that novelists already know that, right? Um, that story is the place where people turn to try to figure out how to navigate life. Um, and I just think that the family counseling side of that uh, matches up really nicely with that. So growing up, were you interested in writing? I mean, it, clearly you went to school for, for counseling. Um, mm -hmm. where, did, where did the kind of the creative outlet stem from? You know, I didn't see myself as a writer early on, but I definitely have always seen myself as a storyteller. When I was a little girl, I was incredibly into my dolls and the stories that my dolls would tell and doll houses and, uh, you know, that turned into acting in high school and college mm -hmm. and, you know, really loving storytelling as it occurred on the stage. Um, I wanted to go to school for dramatic arts, but it wasn't encouraged in, in my day and age when mm -hmm. I was going to college. Uh, and so I took that traditional path of, of educator, teacher, nurse, uh, and so found my way to family counseling. Uh, but I never lost the sense that something about my creative life was missing. And so that's when I turned to writing stories. And that just really is where everything came alive for me. And just being a family counselor, kind of, you're just rooted in conflict, right? It, see, it would seem to me that, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing conflict all day long. And the kind of books that you write and the kind of books that I write are really about conflict. Yes. And so are you, how much inspiration do you get from real stories of people you've uh, counseled? So I agree with you that, you know, in counseling, there's that sense of conflict, but it's also um, not always about conflict. Sometimes it's about trying to understand the story we tell of our own lives and sometimes it's about trying to get rid of the story we tell ourselves. Mm. Um, so I think from that point of view, counseling, my counseling experience helps me a lot to think about story. Uh, but I don't take inspiration from particular people. I mostly take inspiration from the kinds of stories people are struggling with. Right. So I, I, I more along the lines of I, I hear stories about some of the same things over and over again. And in particular, for the dangers of an ordinary night, I was hearing a lot about what it felt like to live with a partner who struggled with addiction and how overwhelming it was to be a caretaker for somebody who you hoped would get better and at times did, but then relapsed and what that sort of back and forth um, experience felt like from someone who loved someone. Um, and didn't and struggled with whether to leave, you know. Um, so that narrative is what kind of, you know, gets stuck when I keep hearing it over and over again. And then I know I want to write more about it to figure it out. And it's it's probably a fine line for you because you could, I'm sure you write that very well. What what that feels like but you also don't want to bury the reader in these feelings of like, Oh my God, this is so depressing. <laughs> you know, there's gotta be, you there's gotta be hope and there's gotta be a way out and there's gotta be, you know, all that with the struggle. Is that yeah. difficult for you to like, okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm mired way too into something that's like, cause we've all seen the depressing movies. We're like, that was a great movie, but. Ugh. 
Yeah, no, I hear you. I think the thing that's kind of funny is that anyone who knows me sees me, I think would say um, that I'm a pretty sunny, happy person. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I write such dark stuff <laughs> emotionally, um, it's, it's really just, I feel like the message and the voice that I bring to these topics is that there is hope, right? And that in fact, some of the darker emotions that we try not to pay attention to, or some of the social issues that we are sort of desperate not to talk about, actually everything's better in the light. You know, everything feels different if you're in connection to other people and if you're talking about the undiscussables in a relationship, right? right? right. So, um, so I do like to leave the reader in a place of hope. And my, my novels always do end with the hope that, you know, in connection to other people and with empathy and with talking about these things, um, we always do better. So what was the, what was the first cre you know, creative thing that you, you wrote and how did you, because you, because you don't come from a background of writing, nor do I. <laughs> How, how was that progression in terms of like, okay, I wrote a short story and it was terrible, but then I learned to do this and that. And what was that progression for you? Well, I would say that off and on through my life, I had written stories, um, short stories, you know, kept a journal, those kinds of things. Um, but none of it was ready for prime time. You know, it, none right. of it was, none of it was anything that I would have shown anyone because I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but when I had the inclination to write my first novel, I knew that I needed to learn. Um, I've been a sort of self-directed lifelong learner. So I took classes and I read a lot about writing fiction and I got into a writer's group and I like really immersed myself in the learning. And then I didn't know what I didn't know. So I wrote the novel, you know, and my <laughs> first one, um, my first novel, um, I was really compelled to write it because it was about something I feared. Um, because I lost my father at such a young age, I feared other loss. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a novel about, you know, my fear of, of losing my children. And, um, and, and that's what propelled me forward. So I think I, in the early days, I was writing about what I most feared. And then it turned into what issues I was most eager to learn more about. Um, so fiction for me has always been about also learning. Um, you know, what do I want to know? You know, the, the old adage, write what you know, I think I do that, but I mostly want to write what I don't know. Totally. Right? Yeah. That's exactly me. I, I, I never write about locations where I live or I want to explore new worlds. Um, but how did you, how did you know, you said, you, you know, you didn't know what you didn't know. So you wrote the novel. How did you know, okay, this, this novel is done. I, there's an arc here that's 85,000 words or how did you know to actually physically put the paragraphs and chapters together? Right. Well, my writing group at the time was enormously helpful because mm -hmm. I was getting feedback as I was going. Um, I also had at the time already had an agent because, oh. uh, being, be, because I was a family counselor. I was already writing book length nonfiction. And so I knew how to write a book length narrative i didn't know the difference between nonfiction and fiction that i had to learn but i already had some skill and i and i often say to writers if you have skill at writing something else like articles or essays or blog posts some of that is transferable not all of it but some of it is and so you want to look at you know how do you construct something from a beginning middle and end um, and and fortunately because i did have the agent that represented my nonfiction. Um, she was helpful in telling me that the novel was there. Oh. Um, she was also, but by the way, she was also uh, able to tell me when I gave it to her the first time that it wasn't there. Yeah. Um, but she was ultimately able to tell me when it was. So she represents both your nonfiction yeah. and fiction. Well, that's that's rare. <laughs> yeah, she she represented my first um, three novels, and then when I took this turn to domestic suspense, uh, we amiably, amiably parted. Yeah. Uh, because that wasn't her genre. Um, but it. again, like that's again something to learn as writers proceed forward is that, uh, you know, that the industry has these marketplace conventions and you have to really be aware of those. Oh, for sure. You don't necessarily have to write to that. And in fact, it's probably not good to do that and certainly not to chase trends. But right to your point, 
you know, be aware of it and just, you know, I'll be writing and I'll, I'll just hear my voice. I'm like, Oh, I totally know what my agent's going to say about this chapter or my editor. Like they won't like this. And, and they'll say that the, you know, the market will say this is too dark or whatever. And, and I'll be aware of that. And maybe I'll go back and change it. But, but yeah, there are a lot of conventions you have to be very aware of. Yeah. So, it's sort of, it's sort of like you need to know the rules before you break them. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's how writing is. I mean, <laughs> you know, most of, I have so many incomplete sentences and so many like run on sentences just because it's my, my style because of pacing, but you know, you have to be aware of like, identify that it is incorrect <laughs> before you can just start doing that and get your voice. How did you, so w- when you, when you made this turn towards domestic suspense, were you kind of cognizantly uh, doing that? Were you aware that you were doing that? You're like, I'm going to set out and write a domestic suspense novel next. No. So I don't think about genre when I start, although I do grapple with whether or not the social issue that I'm interested in, I'm going to tackle it from nonfiction or fiction. So I, I definitely have to make that choice. I did think about writing this book as a a nonfiction narrative about the impact of addiction on families uh, and took the turn to fiction. But once I take the turn to fiction, I don't think about the genre then. I really am concerned first and foremost with the characters and the issue. And then the novel will tell me what it wants to be. Uh, And in this case, it, it definitely, the pace and the fact that inherent in the addiction experience is a lot of deception and and dishonesty among partners um, and a lot of conflict that's very, very challenging. Um, again, it, it really told me that it needed to be teed up in this way. Um, and now I'm kind of liking that, um, that pace, that style, turning up the dial on stakes and tension is really appealing to me. <laughs> uh, making setting a little bit foreboding and atmospheric is really interesting. Um, so I think I'm here for, for a bit, at yeah. least for the the next couple of books anyway. So did you complete this manuscript and turn it into your old agent? And they said, this is not the realm that I work in. That, that happened before. So yes, I, when, when, when an agent doesn't represent the genre, then it's definitely not wise to stay in that relationship. So again, no, you know, you do it in a business like manner and you make different decisions um, but it's important to keep the writing piece, the writing piece. And then when you get to put on your business hat, really have to think about the industry from that point of view. And I think that that's hard for some writers because they don't like to think about the marketplace when, in fact, there are really important ways to think about the marketplace and and how to factor that into your career is really important. How What was the process like finding a new agent? Was that for this book, was that difficult or, cause I mean, that's such a hurdle for anyone getting an agent, <laughs> you know? So you, in fact, you already had one, I'm sure was hugely beneficial, but that doesn't guarantee you're just going to like send out one query and, and, and get hooked up. No, I think it's the same process each time you engage with it, which is that you've got to be thoughtful about who you're approaching. You have to be thoughtful about, you know, what they represent. Um, so, you know, I do a lot of work with writers in this vein. So I help them find agents and I help them query. And so I just applied what I teach other writers to myself. Um, it's, it's, you really have to do your homework and know what the marketplace can bear, what it is you're writing. Uh, it, there's a whole science to it and, yeah. and it's important to know it, right? And to really have people do their homework. What was the process of for you of deciding that you wanted to also teach writing. So wait, tell me a little bit about exactly what you do and and why you wanted to do that. Yeah. So because I've always been a teacher, a family counselor, a nurse, uh, you know, I teach at a college at the college level, uh, family studies. So for me, teaching has always been part of what I do, whatever it is. I know I also want to teach whatever it is I have. I like to be able to share. And so when it came to learning, you know, getting into my self-directed mode of learning to be a writer, uh, once I felt like I had something to offer other writers, I turned to teaching. So I teach through Grub Street. I do manuscript consultations on my own where I give writers guidance 
on either writing nonfiction book proposals or navigating what they need to learn about their own novel manuscript. Uh, and I really enjoy that. It's a, it's a sort of giving back, paying it forward kind of experience. Uh, so I do, I do enjoy teaching. It's for me, that's such an intimidating thing because I would feel like I, I still with the imposter syndrome, I'm like, I don't know this. I can tell you how I do it, but I don't know if it's right. And I don't, you know, and I'm, and there's so not one way of doing things as we know as a writer. So it's just a matter of, I think I could, you know, do like manuscript doctoring, but just having overarching, like, this is how you do things. I would really struggle with that. Cause I, I would feel like I, I wouldn't be in that place to, to, to make those uh, comments, but I'm not a teacher. <laughs> well, and again, I think some people, are inherently have that teaching ability, the, the ability to see things sort of on that bird's eye view level and then also on the micro level. Um, but that doesn't mean everybody does. It's, it's the same thing with, um, you know, with anything related to writing, right? I mean, some people are really wonderful editors and others are not. Um, yeah. Some, you know, people can say, oh, I can notice what's, what's, you know, not working in a manuscript, but I don't really have very many suggestions for how you might address it. So, you know, being an editor, being a teacher, writing yourself, they're, they're all different ways the brain works. Um, and so, you know, I think it's perfectly fine if it's in somebody's wheelhouse or not. Right. So now what going, when you went through your uh, editorial comments with this book, was that a different process than what you had gone through before? Was it more extensive or was it pretty smooth? Always the same for me. My first reaction is I can't breathe right? <laughs> because, <laughs> because I don't know what is going to be suggested. And there's always this feeling for me of if there's something wrong with it, will I be able to fix it? You know, will I be able to see what the editor is saying? Will I be able to address it? Um, and of course, that's silly because, of course, you know, several novels in. I'm going to be able to figure it out. It's just that first moment of, you know, disbelief and, and wondering how big the edits will be. But once I get a sense of what the suggestions are, then I always break it down into two parts. I look at the sort of big picture things that I'm going to need to address. Um, Hallie Efron, the mystery writer, calls that um, the flying high edits. Like, you know, what are the big things I'm gonna have to address? Yeah. And then I break it down into the smaller details, the micro details. And um, I think about Anton Chekhov's uh, way of framing it called little particulars. So I like to think about the little particulars, those things that are gonna be brush strokes, the teeny tiny things that I'm gonna go in to change. When I break them into those two things, then I feel like I have a place I can start. If yeah. I'm feeling really overwhelmed, I can start with little particulars. If I feel more, uh, emboldened, I can start with some of those flying high pieces. And before you know it, I'm inside the manuscript and the work gets done. Yeah. And, and to any listeners who aren't super familiar with the, this whole idea of editorial uh, comments, you get your first round and that's the scary round where you get an email that, you know, has a PDF that <laughs> could be multiple pages long says, here's what we think would help with the book. And, and you usually don't get you know, firm direction. It's just like, Hey, can you add a subplot? You know, cause I want to see more of this character. Right. So these overwhelming, like, yeah. And then when you just look at all, and you're right, your eyes go to like, Oh, I don't like the use of this word. Okay. That's so easy. Let me do that. <laughs> but it is like, and a lot of people I've talked to, they're like, they'll open the letter, read it and just let it sit for a few days before they do anything. Um, because it, because it is overwhelming, but it's also the right way to frame it. And the way that I always try to frame it is I'm kind of excited. I'm like, Oh, this is totally going to make my book better because now I have somebody who's, you know, my, in the industry, who's telling me with a keen eye, this can help your book. And, and how grateful am I for these comments, even though it's going to be a lot of work and it could be two months of work, you know, who knows? Right. Right. Well, remember the brain sees excitement and fear in the same manner, right? So, <laughs> right. So, so it's really perfectly fine to feel both of those things, to be excited and afraid. Um, one of the things that I tell writers that I work with is even when I'm giving them feedback, I always say to them, don't touch your manuscript for a couple of days 
because after you need to let this percolate, you need to let this sink in to your unconscious because you might find some really effortless solutions simply by sitting with the feedback. But if you try to roll up your sleeves and tackle it right away, you're doing it in a defensive manner. You're not doing it in an open manner. Hmm. So I like to wait a few days like you do. And I recommend that the writers I work with do the same. That's a really interesting way of putting it because uh, it is kind of a flight or flight, <laughs> fight or flight response when you get that letter. Um, but to, to, to frame it in that way of like, I never thought about it. Like if, cause I do like to attack things just to get them off my list and, and realizing that that's, from a defensive posture mm -hmm. is a really interesting way of framing it. Cause the other thing, and the whole other side of all of it is, you know, there's so many things you do, you do in your everyday life tasks that you have to complete and you know, where you can cut corners, make things easier. But when you're dealing with your manuscript, I don't know if you, this happens to you, but I'll get tempted to be like, well, I could do this one thing and that would be an easy way of kind of answering this question from the editor. But I know it's not the best solution, but it's easiest. And you have to, I have to really fight that and say like, no, I'm going to really spend a lot more time and, and go deeper. Um, do you, do you struggle with that at all? Or you're always, always giving it your hundred percent. No, I struggle with that. I think it's kind of the difference between people who are process oriented and outcome oriented. If you're outcome oriented, you kind of want to, you know, get it done. Yeah. Um, and, and that doesn't always mean that the choices um, are, are breathing on the page, right? So I think that some writers, and I'm one of them, have to fight that as well. Um, but if you're really honest with yourself, you do already know that you're going to have to go back and change it because it isn't the best solution. Uh, for the dangers of an ordinary night, I had an ending that was convenient. Yeah. And I knew it. I knew it was a convenient ending. And so I wrestled with it for a couple of months. And then I said, okay, no, you got to do the hard ending. You can't do the convenient ending. You've got to go for the hard ending. And that means you're going to have to really challenge yourself as a writer to pull it off. Yeah. Uh, but it was more rewarding in the end to go the harder route. Right. And I feel more proud of the ending now because it's the most authentic. It's the most, it's the most natural. But yeah. it was the hardest to write. But I think what you said is totally true. You have to be honest with yourself. And I think even learning how to be honest with yourself takes time in writing um, because it's, it is very difficult to go back and objectively view your work as you're editing it and saying, you know, could this be better? Because a lot of times you think, this feels fine. I'm, I'm, I'm editing something right now. And I'm realizing this relationship between these two characters is not great. And I don't quite know what the problem is, but I know it needs to change. And I think about that. I'm like, but there's so many chapters with them. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to change something. I'm like, it just doesn't feel great. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. I struggle yeah. with that all the time because it's, it's work and you want to get it done. You want to move on to the next thing. Right. Well, and it's the same with feedback. Um, if you get more, if you get the same feedback from more than one person, you know, we tend as writers to want to be like, well, you just don't understand them then, you know, instead of if you're getting that feedback from multiple readers, you have to, you have to hear it. Right. Now you don't have to solve it the way they're suggesting that you solve it, but you just still have to solve it. Right. right. They're identifying that there's a problem. That's right. Yeah, totally. And, and you also have to learn to who to listen to over time. And I think you being in a critique group from day one, that's one of the smartest things you can do and joining organizations and uh, going to conferences and, and really soliciting feedback because feedback is, you know, like reviews are the same thing. Like you don't have to listen to the reviews, but it's interesting if they all say they didn't like the ending that might inform how you approach your next book. Um, I think that's all important. I do too. I think the other thing that I learned from acting is that art is a collaborative experience, right? There's not one actor on the stage. There are multiple actors on the stage. And even if there is only one actor on the stage, there's everybody that's behind stage, right? And there's directors and lighting and makeup and costumes and props. And so the creative process of art making is 
often collaborative. But for writing novels, we think, oh, no, I have to go it alone. No, you don't have to go it alone. You can get feedback from trusted readers. You can get feedback from content readers. You can get feedback from readers, from writers, right? And why not? Why wouldn't you want to listen to how the experience of that art feels to the reader? Why wouldn't you want to know that? Because it's overwhelming. Yes. <laughs> and it's scary. It's really scary. I mean, even looking at the first, the way that I approach reviews, for example, is that I, I like to follow the reviews very early on, like pre-release on Goodreads and maybe for like a month. Because I, I want to see like, okay, what is the, the reaction? But then I have to, then I kind of just stop. And I very rarely check reviews of my old books. Um, but it's, I think you do have to, you know, you're producing this commodity and you are opening yourself up to give it to the general public. You have to, I think, listen to, to what they're saying because, you know, it's just important. I do too. So there's another thing that I tell writers I work with. Georgia O'Keeffe, the painter, mm -hmm. used to, she had a quote that I loved and it was about settling the piece for herself. And so what she would do is when she'd finish a piece, she would evaluate it based on her own knowledge and experience. And she would say, you know, the piece is this both from a strengths and a vulnerability standpoint. And then if the feedback she got aligned with what she believed were her strengths, hmm. she would say that's true. And if it aligned with what she believed was continued to be vulnerable about the piece, she would say that's also true. And so in a way, it's important that we settle it for ourselves. Maybe we put a piece of work out in the world and we say, you know, these characters could have been stronger or the setting could have been stronger or I'm still working on stakes and tension and conflict. So that when someone says, yeah, you know, your characters really weren't quite there, you could say, I kind of agree. Or if somebody, if you believe that the piece is really strong in conflict and people say it's strong in conflict, you can say, you know what, that's true. So that when you get those reviews, they don't feel like slings and arrows, but they don't inflate your sense of self either. Right. They feel accurate to what right. you believe is true about the piece. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. I'm actually going to the... Uh... Georgia O'Keeffe uh, Museum in a couple of weeks in Santa Fe. So yeah, I will, yeah. I will have that in my mind. Good, good. So in your, in your acting classes, did you have to do improv? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, Definitely. we're going to, we're going to test your improv skills. Right? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> so what's great about the making it up part of all of this is that it is, it is very much improv and it is based on the idea of yes. And right. Uh, you, you you give me a sentence and I give you a sentence and we don't deny each other's sentences, but we yes and it. Um, so I'm going to just grab a book at random. Uh, I'll okay. be right back. This is actually kind of relevant because it's Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, William Martin's Harvard Yard. Marvelous. I read this a long time ago. I really remember enjoying this quite a bit. Um, so give me a page between one and 500. Eight. Oh, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, I went with a lucky number. And then a uh, sentence between, say, one and ten. Seven. Oh, okay. This is good. So I'm going to read this, and then you give me a sentence or two, whatever you want to do, and we'll go back and forth for a couple minutes, and I'll, I'll call it a day then. Uh, he threw an extra log onto the great room fire, wrapped himself in a blanket, and began to sweat and shiver all at once. He shouldn't have had the fourth drink, but she had upset him so much he didn't know what else to do. This wasn't a normal kind of drunk, he thought. He could feel the bile build up and start coming up through his, esophag his esophagus. Did she put something in my drink? Or am I sick and tired of this relationship with Mary? She's always putting me on the defensive, making me feel like the creep that I maybe am. I don't know what to do to please her. She's the most difficult woman I've ever been involved with. He remained under the blanket for another 10 minutes or so and decided he needed to get up and do something despite the aches and the fever. He rose, walked away from the fire, 
and headed towards the bedroom. She had locked the door, but he knew where the key was. And the time had come to confront her no matter how this ended, because it was going to end. One way or the other, he was going to have it out with her. He walked over to the kitchen and grabbed the key to the bedroom. And on his way back, he stopped by the fireplace and grabbed a steel poker. He opened the bedroom door and she was sleeping there. And she, he just hated how she looked when she was sleeping. He took two steps back out of the room over the threshold. It was too tempting, he thought. He could do it. He really could. Back up, he said. Don't. You'll pay. She won't. I think we're going to call it there because I loved, <laughs> I, I loved how you ended that. <laughs> that was such a strong lesson to be learned there. <laughs> <laughs> See, it isn't always right to do the thing you want to do That's or the right. thing that makes sense, right? That's right. Even if the thing you want to do is bludgeoning somebody <laughs> with a fireplace well, poker. Yeah, because I'm not a bludgeoner. So that's why I'm stepping back. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's too personal. <laughs> I don't think I would ever have it in me. Me either. That was fun. Good. <laughs> I'm, I, I am super excited for your release. And, and that's got to be a very fun time for you to see it kind of go out in the wild and see what happens and look at feedback and then just move on to the next thing, which I assume you're knee deep in already. Yes, I am knee deep in the next thing. Um, but yes, it's all been very, very gratifying. And I feel, I feel lucky, you know, it's hard work, no doubt about it. It's a lot of perseverance. Uh, you know, when you're writing a novel and it's in your head 24 seven, even when you're sleeping, it's a lot. Uh, but when you get out there and you can start having conversations about it with readers, there's nothing better. Yeah, and, you know, we are lucky because how many people write novels and never get published and, exactly. It's, it's, it's hard not to take it for granted after a while, but like, you know, some of those feelings never go away when you see your books, you know, for the first time. So, yeah. well, well, congratulations. And it was uh, great being able to spend a little time with you this morning. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. it was enjoy, the, enjoy the rest of your week. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. That was my conversation with Lynn Griffin. She was great, wasn't she? I mean, you could tell you could tell she's a teacher. <laughs> she she's very thoughtful in how she approaches things, and she can. Um, I, I thought she had a very almost a dispassionate way of analyzing, you know, an approach to fiction that was um, pretty cerebral and very intriguing. So, um, you know, I think she's going to have great success in the domestic suspense market. Sounds like she wants to kind of stay in that realm for a while. Again, her recent book is uh, The Dangers of an Ordinary Night. If you want to know more about that book, her other books, or about Lynn in general, just go to her website, which is lynngriffin.com. If you want to know more about me, uh, just go to carterwilson.com. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, there's going to be more episodes coming out soon. In the meantime, take care.